So, um, yes, this is experimental talk. <laughs> so it'll be harder for Bulbul to <laughs> correct me, <laughs> correct me. But I hope she will. <laughs> Actually, I hope the rest of you will. So when I say things that are stupid, which I do a lot, or when I say things that you don't understand, which I'll try not to, uh, please interrupt me and um, tell me uh, or make me explain to you. Um, and I looked at the titles of my talk. I thought they were fantastic. So this is Experimental Collides 1, and tomorrow is End 1 again. <laughs> so this is just one big talk. <laughs> exactly. So I have much more than I could possibly tell you, um, but um, I'll tell you what I can. Um, and actually, this is uh, meant to be really a summary, a review of uh, what you can do with colloids rather than really the very, very cutting edge stuff. It's more to put it all in perspective. Um, so uh, I, I noticed when I looked at the uh, list of participants that there's a lot of theorists. So. I apologize for not uh, telling you too much theory, <coughs> but um, I would say that uh, nothing that we do could really have been done uh, without uh, really a lot of input from theorists. And I'm not going to, I, I'll try and acknowledge things, but I'm not going to be able to acknowledge all the different contributors to all the different work because it's sort of a historical pres uh, perspective. So colloidal particles are ubiquitous. Everybody know what a colloidal particle is. It's a small particle, typically a solid particle, uh, immersed in a fluid. It's small enough that um, you can observe Brownian motion, but I will take a very broad perspective. I have taken a broad perspective and consider things that are larger than the normal canonical one micron, which p people usually talk about. It's just more a matter of time how much they, um, how long it takes to look at them. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So they're really around you everywhere. Certainly in biology, they're all over uh, your viruses, macromolecules. They're all essentially colloidal particles. Um, I would generalize them and say that if I make them, if I make a particle not out of a solid but of a liquid, then it's a, an emulsion and we eat that and we drink that. Um, but the, the physics of the properties are really the same. Uh, they're extremely important. In fact, I think one of the uh, grandfathers of uh, the field of colloidal physics told me that 80% of all processes uh, are all manufacturing processes at some point involve colloidal uh, particles. Um, <coughs> you use them, uh, paints, uh, coatings, uh, their uh, ceramics are start with colloidal particles. And why are they important? Well, a solid is a rock, right? You can't move it around. It certainly can't flow it. I mean, you hear all, all about these granular materials and they say they flow, but they don't really flow, right? They sort of flow. But colloidal particles are a way of getting solids to really flow. Like paint turns out to be a solid on the wall, but you can flow it and you can smear it on the wall and you can flow things. Uh, and that's really the main role of, uh, of these dispersions is to take something that's solid-like but make it into something that's liquid-like, to have something that's solid but have it flow like a liquid. Um, so it's like a solid particle behaving like a continuous fluid. Um, okay, same old, same old. Um, the, the properties that, that we're going to talk about are essentially set by the particle density. And it's sort of interesting to ask, just get ourselves some familiarity of the particle density. Um, the concentration of particles is pretty small compared to things that you're normally used to. So if you take uh, a normal solid, I don't know, uh, take any solid, the, the spacing between the molecules of the atoms are of order a nanometer, right? So uh, that's like 10 to the 27 atoms per uh, cubic meter. Colloids are of order a micron in size. So the concentration is roughly 10 to the 18 particles per cubic meter. Things like then, things that depend on the number of particles and something that has to do with that are very different. Like the latent heat of the phase transitions, you can't measure them. There's just too few molecules or too few particles. The pressure that you have 
is still very important, but it's very low compared to what you're used to. So if we do a simple calculation, like the pressure is just the concentration times kT. Every particle gives you kT of pressure. Um, <coughs> the, the, uh, the total pressure is just the, the number concentration times that. So if I just take these, uh, rough, these rough numbers and I just put the numbers in, I get that the pressures are typically uh, millipascals. Now, let me put that in perspective. Um, the gas, the room, the, the, the fact that there's a pressure in, of the air around us. Well, okay, it's not quite here. It's a little bit less than what I'm used to. I calculated it uh, atmospheric at, um, at uh, sea level. Um, the gas has something like uh, 10 to the 25 molecules per cubic meter. So if you just take this and increase this concentration by about, uh, what's that, seven orders of magnitude, uh, that's uh, four, then that there's four times three is 12, so that's 10 to the five, right? That's an atmosphere, a kilopascal is an atmosphere. So this is like seven or eight orders of magnitude less than an atmosphere. But still there is a pressure. It's an osmotic pressure, but there's still a pressure. Um, in fact, this softness, the fact that the pressures are low, also it's the, you know, the pressure is low. The pressure is going to give me some idea of the uh, bulk modulus, how much it takes to squeeze something. That's going to give me some idea about the shear modulus. They're all going to be of the same order of magnitude. And this is why it's a soft material, right? And what is a soft material? A soft material is nothing more than something that's very weak, has very low la elasticity. Um, I always say you know, the typical difference between this and this is many orders of magnitude, right? This is gigapascals, 10 gigapascals. This is 1,000 pascals, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. It's 7, 8 orders of magnitude. Where do you get that? Well, energy or, or um, um, elastic modulus is a pressure, right? It's an energy density. That's what a pressure is, an energy density. So the energy that these things are held together by our electron volts. The energy that, um, that uh, soft matter, like collars, are held together, well, it's got to be of order kT. It can't be less or the thing would fall apart. So it's some number of kT. That's a couple of, couple of orders of magnitude. You're never going to get a couple of orders of magnitude to change the elastic modulus by seven or eight or nine or ten orders of magnitude. The only way you're going to do that is by different densities of bonds. And so that's really why this material, a colloidal material, is soft. In fact, that's why every material that's soft is soft, because there's a new length scale. There's a much larger length scale that's determining all the properties, determining the elastic properties. And that's why soft materials are soft, not because of the energies, but because of the densities. Uh, so this is what the uh, colloidal particles look like if you just take an image of them. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about actual experimental techniques that we use to, to study them. But here's just an image looking at the colloidal particles in the microscope. And what do you see? Well, you see brownie in motion. That's what Brown originally saw. Brown thought these particles were somewhat alive. It turns out, of course, they're not. Um, a lot of work has, been gone, has gone into understanding Brownian motion. Um, um, Einstein won his Nobel Prize for doing that. Um, the important thing about this is that the particles, just because of the thermal energy, because they're moving in the fluid, the particles are sampling all different phase space. They're sampling different volumes of phase space. So this is a way of ensuring that the particles are thermalized, that they can explore all volumes. And this is just a way, you can get the same thing, for example, if you uh, imagine um, a granular material, you have to shake it to uh, make it find some new configuration. Here, thermal energy is doing it. And the presence of the fluid is what's really uh, causing the, uh, the, the particles to, to allow them to explore the space. But the fluid interactions are a little, a little bit different. The fluid interactions occur. There's actually an interaction between two particles that occurs because there's a fluid. If you were to imagine two particles in vacuum, there'd be no real way of them interacting physically with one another except through some uh, 
forces like gravitational or something like that, some electromagnetic forces. There's no real physical force. If they're in a fluid, then there is. So if this particle moves, oh, he moves, he moves a small amount, he creates a wave in the fluid. He creates a pressure wave in the fluid. That pressure wave causes another, this other particle to move. That's a hydrodynamic interaction. These are exceptionally complicated to understand the hydrodynamic interactions. Um, but the important, about, important thing about the hydrodynamic interactions is that they depend on a velocity. They depend on a time. They only exist on a time-dependent nature. So if you look at static properties, time average properties, they cannot be influenced by the hydronomics. Everything will be averaged out and you will be able to completely ignore the details of the interactions between the particles through hydrodynamics. And so if you study static properties, you can completely ignore these hydrodynamic properties. If you want to study the dynamics, then you can look at the hydrodynamic interactions and you can understand them. They're exceptionally complicated. The reason, of course, is that um, if this guy moves and he pushes this one, then I can calculate that. But if this guy moves, he's going to push this one. And there's going to be basically a many-body interaction. And to try and sum them up is something that uh, is extremely difficult to do. Um, and you can look a lot. You can, uh, if, you, if you keep the concentration relatively low, you can sum things up on a two-body level. Sometimes it gets a little complicated, and people have tried to go to a third and higher order prop, uh, um, calculations. Um, and there are various ways of trying to approximate that. So what are the interactions between two particles? Well, the um, simplest one, and it's simple because you can model this by computer simulation very nicely, then you don't have to worry about um, the, the interactions that you have. Again, if you have these hydrodynamic interactions, if you have any kind of interaction, if you look at the time average, the steady state properties, then the nature of the interactions don't really play a role to understand the static properties of the system. Um, so the simplest interaction is the hard sphere interaction. And basically, this is the one time that I'll allow quantum mechanics to come in. I don't understand it. But basically, two particles can't overlap one another. They can't occupy the same space. That's what the hard sphere interaction is. It's an infinite repulsion right when the two particles touch one another, when their separation is twice the radius of the two particles. So we often draw these little diagrams where we talk about an interaction energy and um, a, uh, a separation, a center to center separation. So this is the hard sphere interaction. This is the simplest one. And uh, as experimentalists, we often try to mimic this interaction. It turns out in really fine detail, it's actually very, very difficult to exactly mimic it, but we can come awfully close and we can learn a lot of the, uh, the properties of materials by mimicking them with hard spheres. Why would you do that? Well, the reason is that, <coughs> as I showed you, you have this concentration of particles. You think that the number concentration is really low compared to the air, so the pressure is really low, but they're soft, they're large, you can see them, they're micron in size. You can uh, explore their properties. You can look at the phase behavior of these things. And so now, if we want to understand the phase behavior, we'd like to have, understand the phase behavior in some known interaction. And it's actually a good thing to, uh, to uh, uh, be able to choose known interactions that we can compare to theoretical calculations. And the hard spheres uh, interaction is one that's been uh, quite widely studied. Um, other interactions, well, <coughs> of course, if you think about it, colloidal particles, the mere s fact that they're colloidal particles, that they're separate particles, is in some sense a non-equilibrium state. It's kinetically stable, but it's a non-equilibrium because the particles, they're the same material. They would like to actually stick together. And even if they don't actually bond to one another, they do always attract one another, and that's just through dispersion forces or van der Waals forces. Uh, van der Waals forces, I think of van der Waals forces as basically dipole-induced dipole. The uh, fluctuations, the dielectric fluctuations in one particle induce dielectric fluctuation in another. That leads to an attraction. Um, this is a fairly short-range uh, attraction. Um, 
the, the presence of the attraction um, requires that, in fact, the uh, nature, basically the dielectric constant of the material surrounding the particles or separating the particles from one another is different than the particles themselves. If it's continuous, you'll never see any kind of interaction. And for some things, we try and actually make things continuous so we can reduce the kind of interactions that, they, uh, that exist. Um, so this is, I just uh, copied a, a formula to, to show you what the, uh, the uh, Van der Waals interaction looks like, but this is the way uh, I, I think of it. It's, of course, uh, exists, doesn't exist, the particles can't touch one another, and then it has basically an R, 1 over R to the 6 dependence, so it's fairly short range um, and it's fairly attractive. So that means that always the particles want to attract one another. You have to do something to prevent them from sticking to one another. If they come really close, they're going to stick to one another. How do you pre prevent them? A standard way is by uh, using electrostatic interactions, using charge. For example, you can put, um, uh, if, if you have a particle um, in a fluid, this, I'm just drawing two, the, the surfaces of two particles are obviously spheres, but I'm just drawing them as solid. You can put charge that exists on the surface of the particle. Now, charge can't exist by itself. There always has to be a balance of charge. So what does that mean? You have charge that exists on the surface of the particle. What it means is that there's a dissociation of charge. So there's one charge that exists on the surface of the particle, and there's a counter ion that would normally neutralize this charge, this counter ion is in solution. You gain entropy by allowing it to uh, exist freely in solution. And that's why uh, many particles are uh, conveniently studied uh, or conveniently produced in water. Water has a high dielectric constant at uh, low frequencies and uh, it makes it very easy to solubilize, to dissolve ions into the solution. And so you can have ions in solution and uh, particles uh, and charges on the surface. So the actual interaction is um, a screen Coulomb interaction. It's screened because you would get just basically a standard Coulomb interaction, charge-charge interaction, because of the, uh, the, the two charges, the like charges on the surface, but it's screened because of the counter ions. And again, I just uh, wrote these down. I, 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 Never worry about what it really means. Why do you actually get an, um, a repulsion or, or a stabilization? Well, you might say the reason is that you have these two charges. They're like charges, and so the particles repel one another. And that's the standard way of thinking. But in fact, that's not really quite the right way of thinking about it. The right way is to recognize that there are these counter ions, and the counter ions can escape to infinity, but they can't completely escape to infinity. Basically, they're a screening length away. That is, I put kT of energy, and I balance kT of energy with the... Uh, with the, uh, the Coulomb uh, attraction, and that tells me how far away the particles uh, uh, can exist. That's the screening length. <clears throat> so now if I try and squeeze these two, uh, these two surfaces together, I'm getting, yes, I'm getting a repulsion because of the, uh, of the charge, but really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to squeeze out these counter ions. And these counter ions have an osmotic pressure. They don't want to be squeezed together. You can't squeeze them together. So the repulsion is actually, um, uh, you're trying to squeeze the counter ions out between the surface. You just can't do that. And that's what leads to the, uh, the repulsive interaction. That's called the disjoining pressure. You just can't compress the ions uh, that exist between the two surfaces. So, yes, sir? Would you say that two different ways of looking at the same thing? Yeah, you can look at it. It's two, it's two ways of looking at it, but I would say that this, by looking at it that way, allows you in more um, complicated situations, lets you understand things a lot better. So I think that um, certainly when I started thinking about things, I always thought about it as just two repulsive particles, two, two uh, coulombic interactions between the two particles. And that's strictly speaking correct, but sometimes when you really want to understand things, it's better to think about squeezing the counter ions and the osmotic pressure of the counter ions. <laughs>
Um, okay, so I can sum these things, and I can generalize. I'm not, I'm not sure I have slides for all the different kinds of interactions, and I can't possibly describe all of them, but there's always going to be something that uh, has the same effect. Basically, there's always some kind of attractive interaction, be it van der Waals or whatever, something that if you push the particles close enough together, they will stick to one another. And therefore, to ensure that that doesn't happen, you have to have some kind of repulsive interaction, and that go, the, in, the repulsion gets larger as the uh, particle separation um, increases or uh, decreases, and the sum of the two gives you the total particle interaction. And this is what it always looks like, at least in schema some schematic form, that. Uh, at far away, there's no interaction. As you uh, come close, there's some kind of repulsion. And if you get really close, they become attractive. And that's a really good way to think physically. You need to have some kind of relatively short range repulsion to ensure that uh, the particles remain stable. Because remember, I show you that they're undergoing a, a random a Brownian motion. Eventually, the two particles will, uh, will come close enough to touch one another. What is it that prevents them from actually sticking together? And it's this repulsive barrier. So you can talk about the stability. Remember, I said there's a kinetic stability for the particles, the kinetic stability is essentially given by this height of this barrier, and it can be hundreds of kT, so it can easily be stable indefinitely. Um, so if you look at things, um, if I um, take just, in fact, if I go back here, and I take this situation where there is some kind of repulsion, and I look and I uh, uh, um, ensure that the, the repulsion is fairly long range, I can do that by essentially keeping um, the, uh, ensuring that the only ions in the solution are the counter ions. There's no extra screening. There's no extra charges in solution that will screen things. Then um, it looks, the system looks something like this. Now, um, uh, a little bit of a um, detailed warning. Um, this is actually uh, not looking at colloidal particles in water. If you were to look at colloidal particles in water, then you know that there are, even if I take all the counter ions out, there are some natural charges just because some of the water molecules, some are OH and some are H plus, just some of them are. It's something like 10 to the minus 7 or something like that, concentration of 10 to the minus 7. So there's always a little extra screening. And the dielectric constant's pretty large, so the length scales get, uh, uh, get small. So the range of the interaction, the range of, uh, range of repulsion that you can get with in water are fairly short. You can maybe get something of order um, a few hundred nanometers. It's about, uh, that's about as large as you can make it. However, if I go to a low dielectric constant like oil, where things, where charges are just barely soluble, in fact, to make them soluble, I have to add some kind of surfactant to uh, soluble, solubilize the counter ions. So then the charges are, uh, the charge concentration in the solution is relatively low, increases the length scale. The dielectric constant is low, increases the length scale. Then I get something that looks like this. I can actually visualize it. This is taken with a um, like in focal microscope. I'll tell you more about how we uh, visualize things uh, in a few minutes. Um, and uh, the size of these are a couple of microns in diameter. You can say, see they're separated roughly by their own size. The important thing to recognize is this is not an ordered system. There is no a long range order. Um, it's a dynamic system. If you were to look at any one of the particles, you can't see it in this because it's just a, a loop of the particles. But if you were to look at any one of the particles and follow it in time, it would explore eventually all of space. Nevertheless, there is a characteristic length scale. And there's a characteristic length scale because you're starting to push them together and they're starting to repel one another. And so the length scale is sort of set by essentially the uh, uh, concentration and the size of the particle. That's what's setting this length scale. If I, let me just show you this, if I decrease the amount of screening, I decrease the length scale between the interaction, I can do that. If I go back here, I'll show you how I do that. I go back here, I add some salt. 
that changes the screening length, that decreases the screening length, it means the particles can come much closer together before they start feeling this repulsive interaction. If I do that, then the system looks like this. And you can see now the particles are much more random. They, there's, no, there's no longer this real characteristic length scale uh, of the repulsion. And uh, they can explore all spaces. They can come arbitrarily or very close together. But they don't stick to one another. So there's still some kind of repulsive barrier. This is a slice through a 3D system. Yes, sir. Um, okay, so um, hydrodynamic interactions are always present. Um, the time scale for hydrodynamic interactions is typically nano, nanoseconds. We're looking here at uh, milliseconds or uh, fractions of a second. It's, it's basically video rate that you're looking at here. So the um, hydrodynamic interactions have been average, time averaged out. You're not really seeing much effect of them. They're there, but you're not seeing effect of them. Uh, there are van der Waals interactions. They're being scre uh, screened. Um, a detail of this, since we're doing confocal microscopy, um, we have to index match the uh, particles to the solvent. Otherwise, you get too much scattering. One micron diameter particles scatter like mad if they don't have the same index as the solvent. The fact that they have the same index reduces the van der Waals interaction, but they're really the same index in the optical regime. It doesn't mean that they're the same index across all frequencies. There still will be some um, va uh, van der Waals interaction, but there is something that's stabilizing them. Yes. Uh, okay, so how can we study them? This is sort of a, um, a long uh, list of, of, of ways that you can study them. Um, interestingly, this is also sort of um, in um, chronological order. The very early days, uh, okay, so a little bit of history of uh, colloids. Um, so I'm trying to think the first real scientific studies of colloids were the studies of colloidal gold by Faraday. Uh, there's still some of his samples that exist in the Royal Society in London. He was worried about stabilization of colloids. And he realized if you coat them with protein, they remain stable. Um, and then there's a real long history of uh, basically physicists studying colloidal particles, uh, Smolkowski, um, Faraday, um, Rayleigh, uh, all kinds of uh, physics studies of colloidal particles. And um, uh, then, then it became much more uh, the realm of chemical engineering because you use them for processing materials. And roughly in the, let's see, um, how long, about 30 years ago, um, Peter Pusey um, and Bill Van Megan uh, restarted uh, the field of uh, colloidal physics by recognizing that um, you could model hard spheres really well with colloidal particles. And then uh, physicists uh, continued to study that for, for a number of years. In those days, um, Peter being basically a light scatterer, uh, a lot of the early work was done uh, with static and dynamic light scattering. Um, more recent uh, developments of, uh, of different times of light scattering, I'll mention them briefly. Uh, more recently, as microscopes, particularly can focal microscopy, has improved, uh, there's been an evolution to study things not just with uh, light scattering, but with microscopy. Uh, both of them have uh, advantages. Uh, light scattering gives you a sort of a time and an ensemble average, both in time and space of uh, the sample, whereas um, uh, microscopy allows you to look at individual particles and follow them in real time. And of course, um, you can't ignore uh, the importance of the rheological uh, studies of these things. Uh, they're why you want to use colloidal samples. So you, you have to uh, include uh, studies of that. But um, um, uh, I, think, I think recent developments have also tried to correlate uh, more single particle, um, individual particle measurements or understanding with the rheological uh, measurements. And I'll try and point some of these things out. 
So just a survey uh, of experimental tools. This is a, um, uh, a light scattering uh, instrument. Uh, basically, you have a laser. You have the sample in here. It's in a spherical uh, container. And this is the arm with the detector. It can uh, uh, move around, and you can look at different um, um, different angles. You can measure both the total scattered light and the dynamics of the scattered light. I'll show you what I mean. Um, if you, well, let's see, I can do an experiment here. Let me see. Uh, if I, where is it? Here. Um, if I hold my, um, my laser um, as steady as I can, what do you see? You see the bright spot in the middle, but what do you see on the sides? You see little speckles, right? The speckles come from if I take scattered light and I sum up all the random scattered light, I get a random pattern, but I don't get nothing. I get some things that add up and the interference adds up to something that's positive. Sometimes the interference adds up. There's nothing there. And it's random, and so I get a speckle pattern. So if you look off to the side, this is exactly what you're doing with static, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, light scattering, as you're looking at these speckle patterns. If you sum and the time, uh, if you uh, uh, average them, then that's the, the total static scattering. But OK, I can't make the wall move, but I can move my laser. And you see that as I move my laser, the speckle pattern changes. If I could move the scattering from the wall, the speckle pattern would evolve in time. And if then I look at not the whole pattern, but if I look at just one of the speckle spots, just one of the speckle spots, and I allow the particles to move, so it fluctuates, it will fluctuate in time, and I can measure those fluctuations, and I can learn something about the system. So what's the physics of that? The f yes, sir. The size scale is basically I take the uh, region that I'm looking at, and I sum over all the paths. And I, if I go from here to here, from one from the bright to the dark, if I sum over all the paths, their total phase changes by a wavelength or half a wavelength, and it goes from positive to nothing, or from positive to, from high to low. So it's just looking at the phase change of the different angles that I come. So it's basically a solid angle that tells you this, and you can adjust the size of the speckle by just adjusting the optics. Okay. It's scattering from the colloidal particles in that case. Here, here the scattering is from the surface. It's a rough surface, so some of the light's scattering off to the sides, and then it's rescattering into your eyes. Um, see, may, can we do this? But you say the size of the speckle has nothing to do with. Uh... You can see the scatter from the bubbles. <laughs> I won't do it too much, because it'll blind you if it goes into your eye. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It, it's to do with the optical length scales. It doesn't have anything to do with the intrinsic length scales in the system. That's right. And so if it's moving, and I mean, we can understand the physics right away, right? If it's moving, how much does a particle have to move so the light changes, it so that the speckle goes from light to dark? A wavelength. Only, only length scale in the problem, right? Okay, you're, you're almost, you're 99% you're right. It's, it's really, if I look at an angle, it has to move something so that I project it along the angle. So it depends on the scattering vector. Okay, but otherwise you're exactly right. So it moves by way. So what do I just tell? I know how to, I can measure the dynamics. I can measure how long it takes for particles on average to move a wavelength. Okay, it's a lot more complicated than mathematics, but I just want to get the physics across. So, okay, here's a speckle. This is looking at it. So dynamic light scattering is looking at a single speckle, watching how it moves. Um, uh, static light scattering is, uh, is watching it, time averaging over many speckles. Uh, this is what it looks like. Of course, this is a hand-drawn um, uh, uh, drawing. Now, how you immediately you can understand something really super simple, right? So if I have one speckle, then it can go between nothing and something, right? That gives me a huge amplitude of the fluctuation. If I have two speckles, 
then the amplitude goes down, right? It's a signal to noise problem. So sometimes I want to throw away total intensity and get larger fluctuations. And I do that by decreasing the amount of light I look at and just looking at single speckles. And then to, to measure this, how do I measure this time dependence? There's clearly some time scale here. How do I measure it? Well, I just take an autocorrelation function. You, however you like to calculate an autocorrelation function. Me, I think of it, I take the pattern in time and I take an uh, uh, m- image of this uh, same copy. Of, I just shift it along and take the product of those things and measure how it decays. And so this is, notice, the lag time, that's a time shift. This is a uh, logarithmic uh, scale. And so if I don't shift it by much, these things haven't changed much, so it's constant. If I shift it, uh, as I shift it, so the, I get comparable to this time scale, it starts to decay. And if I look at long times, then it's all decayed away. There's no correlations left between the uh, peaks. It all averages out. Okay, this is just the, uh, the details. Um, I don't want to belabor this, uh, and I'm sort of hand uh, brushing enormous amounts of information under the rug. You can look it up or you can ask me. I can tell you, I just want to get across the main physics points. And the main physics points is what I said. It's how long things move, or how, how long it takes for things to move of order a wavelength to watch them decay. And so if you look at what it uh, looks like, um, the, uh, the actual decay looks like E uh, exponential is this is so this is actually an exponential decay. This is plotted logarithmically. If I plot it semi-log, you'd see it's a straight line. I'll show you some cases of that. It's exponential, and the wavelength is really the scattering vector, and it depends on the scattering vector times the uh, position of the particle, the change in position of the particle, uh, and it goes as the square of this. So it looks like this. So if uh, the particles are diffusing, it uh, decays linearly with time, uh, and this is just the diffusion coefficient, the Stokes-Einstein diffusion coefficient minus Q squared. Or you can take this and you can interpret this, and you can actually extract the mean squared displacement of the particle. It's a mean squared displacement. It has to be squared. It has to mean squared because it has to, be, ha- has to give you something. But you can actually extract the mean squared displacement on average of the particles. So the beauty of light scattering um, is that you can get an ensemble average of the system. And you can get that in a very easy, uh, simple way. You can learn something. If it's diffusing, you can learn something about the diffusion coefficient. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so now we can understand something really super simple. Again, Q in this direction is really large, so it decays really fast. If I, if I, if, where's my scatterer? Here's my scatterer. Close your eyes. It won't hurt you. So if I look in this direction, things decay very fast. Because one over the scattering vector, one over the wavelength, basically it's a wavelength times sine two theta. Basically, that's a very short length scale. If I look in the forward direction, then it decays much more slowly. And so that is um, a technique that people have sort of started to use a number of years ago, um, uh, where you uh, look at the forward scattering, and now things slow down. It takes a long time for the speckles to change, so you can use much simpler optics, much simpler detection. What you typically use now is a uh, um, uh, camera, and you just take the speckles and correlate the speckles. And of course, if it's an isotropic sample, it depends on the wavelength, uh, on the scattering vector. But if it's isotropic, the scattering vector just depends on this length scale here. And so it's the same in all directions. So you can uh, average, uh, azimuthally average, and get much higher statistics. So you can make up for the fact that things take a long time to decay by taking an average over many speckles. And so this is a way actually of studying very, very slow decays, um, but being able to do it in even just one decay time, which can be hours to days, because you're just averaging so many speckles. And so this is a way of looking, a very nice way of looking at aging. Uh, the first person who did this was uh, Luca Cipolletti, who uh, was a postdoc at the time in my group. Uh, okay, the same sort of thing. 
Um, then finally, just a few words for um, another technique um, that um, was developed uh, by this cast of characters um, a long time ago in the 80s. The, the, the realization is that everything I show modern colloids are index matched. That is, modern colloids are made with materials that have exactly the same index of refraction as the solvent, so the degree of scattering is relatively low. You can see right through the system. If you want to think about the normal colloidal system, the, a good system to think about is milk. Why is milk white? Milk is white because it's got, it's, it's uh, homogenized, it's got fat. Uh, every, Everybody heard of 2% milk? How much fat does 2% milk have? One guess. 2%. Oh, good. <laughs> How much fat does whole milk have? Anybody know? How much fat does skim milk have? None. None. Skim. Okay, now. Okay, how much fat does heavy cream have? 16. Real good heavy cream. Okay. Think of you know, this is really this is very simple. Okay, I, you know, me, I, I just like to think about think about real things. I'm, I'm an experimentalist. That's all I do. I can think about what's around me. So think about heavy cream. It is super super white, right? You go down to light cream. It's not as white. You go down to whole milk. It's not as white as heavy cream, right? Two percent milk is less. How about skim milk? Still white, right? Oh. Even better. Are you sure that's not butter? <laughs> that must be whipped cream. Okay. Thank you. Well, wait a minute. Skim milk. Skim milk. What the hell's going on? I'm lying to you, right? Really? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No. no. There's also micelles. There's little micelles, uh, casein micelles that are always in the milk, and they just scatter just a little bit. So they're sort of, they still enough to scatter. They're much smaller. So back to why it's white. Well, homogenization is basically mixing the hell out of the milk. It makes the particles, it makes the fat drops about a micron in diameter. A micron, that's the size of the wavelength, scatters like mad. The more you put in, the more it scatters. Even down to nothing, well, okay, you get rid of all the scattering, there's still some micelles left that do some scattering. So diffusing wave spectroscopy is saying, well, look, how, you know, my light scattering, remember, I told you my light scattering, I need to know the scattering vector, right? So the scattering vector is determined by the angle. If I shine my light in here, I look at this angle, I know the angle exactly, right? So that works really well, and as long as I know the angle, it works fine. But if something is milky white, do I know the angle that it scatters? No way in hell. But wait a minute. I still, if I can't, I don't have milk here, I'd do it otherwise. It, take, take, take your laser pointer, shine it at milk. Homework problem. Got to do it tonight. Okay, you don't have a laser pointer, you can borrow mine. You don't have milk, there's some in the cafeteria, I'm sure. Got to do it. Got to watch it. Experiment for you to do, okay? I'm going to test you tomorrow. No. So if you do that, you'll see that it still scatters. So what the hell's happening? How can we understand it? Well, if it's just like skim milk and you take a little bit of skim milk, a thin path of skim milk, it'll scatter and maybe it'll scatter once and maybe it'll scatter twice. And so I could probably try to calculate the scattering. I say, well, look, most of the light gets scattered maybe two times. So I get scattered once, and then I average over all the scattering and try and do that. Ooh, it's complicated. Then I, I say, well, it's a little bit more concentrated. It scatters three times. It's even more complicated. So if it scatters a million times like it does in milk, you'd say there's no way in hell you can calculate it. Actually, it turns out to be really simple because then you can make a completely different approximation. Then you can say that the light, the photons of the light, diffuse through milk. In fact, this is well known. That's the way light propagates through clouds. It diffuses. And if it's diffusion, I can go back and I can calculate it. For example, if I take a short pulse of light, 
This is a Gedanken experiment. If I take a short pulse of light, actually, it's a Gedanken experiment, but you can do it, and people have. I take a short pulse of light, light and I pass it through something where it scatters like mad, and then I look at the light that comes out, you'll see that this short pulse, pulse becomes my, very, very broadened. The reason it becomes broadened is here, these are the things that come out at first. There's a very, very few times that the light goes all the way through and comes out like this. But most of the time, the, walk, the light takes this random walk and eventually comes out. Some of it takes a really long time. And the path length is just the time. So I get this dispersion. Something that starts with a delta function gets spread out. I get a dispersion. And it's just the same thing as if I take diffusion of anything you like, heat, whatever your favorite thing that diffuses. If I take something that diffuses through a slab and I calculate it, this is what I get. But now I can do all my calculations again, just assuming that it's dispersion. And so <coughs> the way to think about this is that now I have any given path, it depends on many, many scattering events. And sometimes later, each of these scatterers has moved some random distance. So I can just calculate the total phase change on average of all the particles moving some random distance for some uh, path of some length uh, L. And this path then I just have to sum over all the different paths, but I can do that. I can do that because I've measured that distribution of path length because I've measured the dispersion. I can calculate, just use the fusion uh, equation. So, I mean, you do this, the calculations uh, look uh, complicated, but it's really it's just uh, doing the proper calculation. And the correlation functions are absolutely measurable, but the difference is that now, you're not looking at the motion of a single particle, but you're looking at the motion of all the particles in the path length. And so on average, how many particles are there? Well, I can say, look, on average, the light scatters, uh, there's a certain scattering length. So every time I go a scattering length, it scatters a certain amount. And Okay, I can put the angle dependence, I can put all the complicated things. It's not important. I mean, it's just, it's in the details, but I scatter a certain amount, and then I just have to ask how long, how long the path length is in terms of the scattering length. And it's just the, it's just going to be proportional to the, the total distance through divided by that scattering length squared. And so that's how many scattering events that I have. Then each scattering event, I, I'm going to have a change in the path length, and I, I, I'm measuring only how that whole path length changes by a wavelength. So I get to look at the motion of a little particle because I'm looking at thousands of other particles at the same time. So what that means is now I don't have to wait. Before, remember, the time scale was how long it took for a particle to move a wavelength. Now it's how long the particle uh, takes to move this small fraction of the wavelength. It can be one in 10,000. So now, instead of looking at length scales of motion, at length scales of motion that are of order a wavelength, I'm looking at uh, length scales of, of motion that are a hundredth of a wavelength or something like that. And so now, rather than looking at hundreds of nanometer motion, I can look at motion that are a few nanometers. So, but roughly speaking, so that the diffusive light scattering, that exponential where you had a few, few times. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Roughly speaking, oh, there's a lot of complications, and you can put all you you, you put all that in. But, that but roughly really speaking, that's the physics. That is really the physics. So the Q gets replaced not by one over the wavelength, but one over one hundredth of the wavelength, one over one thousandth of the wavelength, depending on the yeah, depending on how it is. Okay, okay. So. Um, Okay, I, I just wanted to point this out. This was something that now makes feasible a lot of scattering. It's still relatively widely used for studying very uh, more technical samples. Uh, probably its most interesting application, and I won't describe this at all, um, but its most interesting application is for studying um, activity in the brain because you can do this, you can use light that propagates through, your, uh, through the brain. A red light will propagate a reasonable amount through the brain, and you can study the motion of the blood through the vessels in the brain and interpret it using diffusing wave spectroscopy. And that's actually a fairly powerful technique to look at um, a neuronal, neuronal, neuronal activity. 
Okay, so um, more recently, um, uh, almost all colloidal studies have at least, uh, if not exclusively moved, uh, moved at the same time to using microscopy. Uh, it's really the develop development of a uh, confocal microscope that's allowed you to do this. Um, let me think. A confocal microscope was first proposed in um, uh, 1947. It's a brilliant proposal. The problem was there were two ingredients that require it to make, to make it work. One is a really high-speed computer, and two is a laser. Both of them didn't exist in 1947. I think it was patented. I don't think a patent went, went anywhere. Uh, now both of them exist, so now we can do it. So um, the basis of a confocal microscope is really pretty simple. You image things the way you normally do, but you image things with um, a, um, a laser, and you focus the laser to a diffraction-limited point in the sample, and you scan that point. And typically what you do is you use fluorescence, so you don't actually take, you can uh, detect the scattered light, it's just more difficult. Typically you put a dye in and you detect the, uh, the uh, fluorescence that comes out, but you image that. Rather than taking an image th of the sample, you image that through a confocal pinhole. So if the light, if this is the point where the laser is exciting the sample and it's focused to a diffraction limited spot, and I image that back through a diffraction limited pinhole, then although there's light because the laser is focused here, there's fluorescence that's being excited all around here, none of that gets through the pinhole. Only the light that's emanating from this confocal limited uh, spot gets through the pinhole. So I can see only what's happening at one diffraction limited spot. And then I just scan that spot back and forth, up and down, and I can reconstruct an image. And uh, the whole evolution of confocal microscopy is how to do that faster and better and do the three dimensions and do the analysis and all this. And certainly over all the years that I've watched the instruments, they get better and better and better and more and more sophisticated. But now they're basically tools that allow you to scan many slices in two and three dimensions. Basically, you take a slice, scan like this, like this, and then take another slice. And there are a lot of variants about this. Um, let's see. In fact, um, the recent Nobel Prize on super resolution microscopy um, did not go to confocal microscopy, but something that's sort of similar uh, the 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 way you get super resolution so super res so so confocal microscopy is limited to resolution set by the Rayleigh criterion set by how well you can focus the light that tells you the resolution you can improve that by going to some nonlinear effect so maybe you have a distribution and power and you can have a much narrower region where if you're doing two photon excitation of some sort you um, get improved resolution. Even better resolution is this um, uh, hole burning effect that Stefan Hell won his, his portion of the Nobel Prize. But the real super, the su simplest super resolution microscopy is actually even more ridiculously simple. It's that if you take a point source and you illuminate a point source and you take two point sources and illuminate, how well can you resolve them? That's the question. Who's going to answer it? The wavelength of light, right? The Rayleigh criterion. Half a wavelength. How do you make it super resolution? Resolve one and then the other separately in time. If you have only a point source, how well can you identify where that is? You know what the, it's a Gaussian response. You just have to find the center of the Gaussian, right? So it doesn't depend on the right wavelength. It just depends on the signal to noise. And so if I see two, but I separate them in time, I measure where this one is, I measure when this one is, then I can determine them to much higher resolution. And that's what all of these new techniques, the, um, what's the name, Betzig won his, uh, the Nobel, is it Betzig? I think so. Uh, won the Nobel Prize 
for that, just the recognition of that. And that's the super resolution microscopy. So this is not quite super resolution. You can make it into super resolution, but you lose the time dependence, the nice time dependence. Okay, the final experimental technique, which I will also discuss is rheology. Um, and rheology is just um, um, the fact that I told you that you want to make things flow, but really soft materials both flow and can be elastic. Um, I always think of a soft material, as I showed you, something with a low elastic, uh, elastic constant. If it's a low elastic constant, there's always, in any material, there's also a loss constant. And you can get that by doing an oscillatory measurement. If I do an oscillatory measurement, then the part, the response that's in phase with my drive is the elastic constant. If I have a spring and I pull it, it depends on how much I pull. The force depends on how much I pull. If there's a loss, it depends on how fast I go. So if I go like this, there's an out of phase component that depends on the speed if I put in a, a sinusoidal e excitation. And that gives me the loss. And so things like bridges have a loss modulus. Bridges are a pretty stiff object, but they still have a loss modulus. Things like your tissue have a much larger loss modulus, but they're basically the same thing. And you can study them the same way. You just put an oscillation. You measure the in phase and the out of phase. You measure the elastic and the viscous components. Um, I won't go through the details. I will show you an example. This is, and I'll, I'll show you where this comes from later, but I show you this because this is, in my mind, absolutely ubiquitous for all soft materials. This is what a rheological response, an oscillatory response. This is the elastic constant. This is the loss constant. This is a function of frequency. These are scaled frequencies. So um, uh, you, in order to get this full range, I needed to, to do a lot of scaling of data. But you always, any soft material I've ever looked at looks something like this. There's an elastic constant that's more or less constant, not quite, but more or less constant over some range. There's a loss uh, modulus that's also more or less constant, but eventually at high frequencies, it overcomes the uh, elastic mo modulus. At low frequencies, there's something else going on. And in between, there's some dip. There's something uh, uh, one uh, or half to one to two orders of magnitude different. That's how lossless the material is. So a bridge will have an, uh, a loss modulus at several orders of magnitude less than the elastic constant. You, your skin, your uh, tissue will have a, a loss constant that's sort of a, um, a factor of three or four or five less than the elastic uh, than your elastic constant. And this kind of behavior is ubiquitous. It's always seen for almost any soft material I know. And in fact, I would argue that there's still some debate as to why it has this functional form. There are some proposed explanations. Um, I don't personally think that it's uh, well defined, uh, well resolved as to exactly why it has this functional form. I could spend a whole lecture trying to explain what I think it is, but I don't think we really understand it. Um, by the way, the reason, the simple reason, and I'll come back to the simple reason that eventually, eventually the loss modulus becomes more important. You can think of it as because all soft materials are somehow composed of something that's solid-like and something that's liquid-like. Um, the colloidal uh, particles that I've talked about are solid-like particles inside a fluid. And if I do things really fast, then the solid-like behavior is important. Um, uh, that's, that's a really high frequency. If I do things at relatively slow, then I don't, I'm, I'm not giving, there's, there, or there's a reason why there's still an elastic constant. Exactly why it is, is a subtle thing. I'll try and explain some examples of that. But as I go faster and faster, then the fluid is always something that the contribution of the fluid, something that's a viscous fluid, would look like this on a plot like this. So it's always increasing. The response of a fluid is increasing linearly with frequency and always does. So eventually, if I go to high enough frequency, that overcomes the response of the solid part. And I start seeing that dominate. That's why it crosses over. What I talked about, eventually, everything becomes solid-like. So eventually, it 
um, behaves differently, but that's at much higher frequency. You know that that's the case, by the way, because uh, you know exactly how water behaves, right? Water pours nicely, you can drink it. Try running through it. The faster you run through it, the harder it, go, the harder it is to run through it. Try jumping off a bridge. That's really painful. Eventually, it's concrete, kills you, right? Because you can't get the water out of the way fast enough. So that's how it goes from liquid to more um, uh, 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 more uh, uh, response that's, that's, that's leading to larger and larger forces until ultimately it becomes solid-like. Okay, so I told you that the colloidal particles, the interesting thing about the colloidal particles is that we can study their phase behavior. So the simplest particles are hard spheres. They interact only by excluded volume. In that case, there is no characteristic length scale, or the, the only characteristic length scale that can be left in the problem is actually the size of the particles. You can't even have a characteristic length scale given by one over or one over the cube root of the concentration, because if the particles are separated, they don't know that the other particles exist. The only time they know that the other particles exist is when they collide with one another. So there's only one length scale in the problem, and that's the um, uh, that's the size of the, the particles. However, the concentration does tell you, the, the, the measure of the concentration uh, does tell you how much volume there are for every particle. And that's the other important parameter. So if you look at the phase behavior, in the phase behavior there's only one variable in the, in that determines the phase behavior, that's the concentration. And if you look at the concentration, you see at very low uh, concentrations, their uh, particles behave uh, fluid-like. As you increase the concentration, then they undergo a phase change. And if you allow things to equilibrate, what you find is that as you increase the concentration and you allow them to equilibrate, between about 49 and 54 percent, they begin to phase separate. They phase separate into a liquid-like region and a solid-like region, the solid-like region is a crystal. If you go above 54%, the whole sample is crystalline. So what is it that causes crystallinity even though there's no interaction between the particles? Well, it turns out because there's no interaction between the particles, the only thing that's left is phase space or entropy. And remember, the particles can explore all phase space, so they can find all phase space. And now what they want to do is uh, minimize the entropic energy. And that means that's the equivalent of having as much entropy, having as much phase space available as, uh, as possible. That, another way of saying is that you want to have as much empty space around each par particle as possible. And then you can understand things just by knowing two things about packing. What's the maximum that you can pack particles, spherical particles, um, if they're completely random? Anybody know? That's an absolutely well-defined number. I don't think people yet can tell you um, theoretically why the number is what it is, although they can calculate it. Anybody know what it is? 63%. What is that? Random close packing. You know, here, I'm giving you the answer and still you're hesitating. Good man. <laughs> you guys, you know... 3D. 3D, yeah. So if you insist that they're random, their orientation is random, and now there's a huge amount of studying about the nature of the random orientation, but if you insist the orientation is random, then they can, you can pack them to 63%. If, however, you order them on a crystal lattice, uh, um, like, let's say, a, a FCC or HCP lattice, then you can pack them to, 40, to 74%. So it turns out, then, that the free volume, the amount of space, depends on the packing, and it increases just by causing the particles to order. So the particles spontaneously order somewhere between 49 and 54 percent, and they're completely ordered above 54 percent. So they form crystals, and you can see this. You can actually see this in the confocal microscope images. You can see this in the scattering images. The very first images I put at the beginning of the talk had some uh, diffractive uh, optical scattering from these things. Of course, if you increase the concentration even more, 
Uh, okay, I showed you this. If I increase the concentration even more, then although I said that the particles can find and, and uh, thermalize, if I increase the concentration too much and I don't allow the particles to, um, to um, uh, take this ordered state, but I rather quench them into some state, then the amount of time it takes to find this ordered state gets longer and longer, and in fact, they become glass-like. So this is now a nice way of studying liquids, uh, liquid to crystal transition, uh, crystal to, so to glass transition, or just the glass-like behavior. And uh, this is one of the uh, nice things, or widely used things about colloidal particles. So now we can think about a, um, um, a, a more general state diagram uh, for uh, colloidal particles. I want to introduce this and then I want to describe certain things uh, about the state diagram. So here, now we have a state diagram. There's no interaction between the particles, none whatsoever. But I can induce some kind of interaction between the particles. Let me induce some attractive interaction that's say of order kt or a few kt, but allow there to be an attractive interaction. How can I induce uh, in a very simple way an attractive interaction? This is an amusing way of doing it using purely repulsive uh, interactions. And that's through, okay, this is just the highest here. That's through uh, uh, what's called depletion attraction. So remember what I told you is that I like to, uh, if I have systems that are thermalized, I like to ensure that they find a system with the maximum amount of free volume, the amount of, uh, maximum amount of volume that the particles can explore. That's why you go from a liquid ordering to a crystalline ordering. But what happens if I take particles and I add to them much smaller particles? This is typically done by adding some small inert polymer to the solution. There are many other ways of doing it. What happens if I do that? then the small particles can diffuse just and mix with the large particles. Everything is thermalized. And in principle, they should just uh, diffuse around the same way. However, if you bring two particles close together, then there's a volume around which the, um, um, the uh, small particles are depleted. But if you think about it, if I bring these two particles close together, there's a certain volume where you know, the, part, the small particle can only approach the large particle to within the radius of the small particle. So there's a region that's excluded, a small shell that's excluded around the large particle. And there's another small shell that's excluded around the other particle. If I bring them together, that excluded um, region is now, it's excluded from this one, and this one is excluded from this one, it's overlapping. So actually, I reduce the total excluded region, and I increase the volume at which the small particles can explore. So what that does is there's actually an entropic region, reason that the large particles want to approach one another. They actually stick. There's an attractive interaction that's driven by the small particles. Another way, if you prefer, another way of thinking about it is if I have a small particle and I, if I have a large particle, I have small particles, they're exerting an osmotic pressure just the same as the gas molecules in the air. They're exerting an osmotic pressure in all directions on this particle. If I take two particles like this, there's a misbalance in osmotic pressure. There's an osmotic pressure of the small particles this way and osmotic pressure of the small particles this way when they're close together, but nothing that pushes them apart because there's no small particles there. So that gives you an attractive interaction. So this is a very simple way of inducing an attractive interaction with purely repulsive interactions. You just add much smaller particles. Of course, the, um, you have a, um, a lot of uh, uh, different um, uh, uh, control parameters, you can control the relative size of the small particles, you control the concentration of the small particles, you control the uh, concentration of large particles. And what that does is it gives you now a way of controlling for, uh, as a function of the uh, volume fraction of the uh, large particles, 
So the concentration of the large particles, it gives you a way of controlling the concentration of the, or the degree of attraction between them. You just control the concentration of the small particles. And this leads to a much more, a uh, much richer and more complicated phase space if you, um, even if you induce some attraction, if the attraction is less than kT, you can easily equilibrate. If you induce, uh, uh, you, you can get to some equi um, equilibrium structure. If you induce a larger interaction, then you can uh, force non-equilibrium structures. And basically, you can take things that um, are much lower in volume fraction, and you can make them attractive, and you can actually drive a phase transition between a fluid-like structure and a solid-like structure. And a lot of what you can do here is explore the different nature of these things. I don't have time to tell you everything, but I thought I'd try and tell you a little bit about each of the regions. So here you have um, something that's more colloidal glasses. Uh, if you have no um, uh, attraction, that's just the colloidal glass. I'll describe something about that. Here you have a very strong attractive inter interaction, much, much larger than um, uh, KT, and that leads to some very interesting structures, leads to fractal structures, leads to uh, gel structures. I'll, I'll describe a little bit about that. And in between, you have something where you have something that can be can gel or not quite gel. You get different types of phase transitions, and I'll show you something about um, each uh, about these as well. So let me uh, spend some time now. Um, I know, yes, sir. So remember what I said. There's this repulsive barrier, right? That's the interaction we're talking about. And I said that can be hundreds of kT because that will be really strong. This one is an attraction. This is the well. And so there I can have a, I basically I'm going to get rid of the, um, uh, actually, I should say, let me draw it more strictly correct. This is what I had here, right? I never actually want to get rid of this. Because if I get rid of this, they fall into an attractive well that's so deep that they won't come out. That, I shouldn't say I never, that I do here. This is where the attractive energy is really large compared to KT. So then I don't care whether I'm here or not. If I want to make them slightly stable, what I do is I put a little well here. And this can be of order, you know, 1 to what, 10 KT, something like that. Of order that. If it's larger than KT, KT, I might as well forget about it. It's just going to be um, irreversible. And then there will be some well that prevents them from getting into the irreversible um, attraction. Everything's dictated by KT. And you got basically an attempt frequency, the diffusion coefficient, times e to the minus energy over KT. That tells you how stable things are. Is what? Yeah, um, I won't describe that, but that's strictly uh, the case that if you um, have a colloidal glass and you induce a small attraction, you actually can melt the colloidal glass and then you can re-solidify it. So what's the physics of that? Well, the physics of that is a colloidal glass is where things are basically stuck in space because they're packed at their random close packing or close to the random close packing. It takes a long time be because of that. There's very little extra volume. It's very hard for one particle to diffuse by another. But if I make them slightly attractive, then I s pull them together just a bit. That actually frees up a little volume because rather than just packing them randomly, they're getting more, more tight clusters. And that frees up a little volume, so that actually will liquefy the sample. So that's an observation that um, Wilson Poon and Peter Pusey made a number of years ago. Um, it can be come from depletion, or it can come from just uh, removing the repulsive barrier. So it can just be Van der Waals. I'll show you both. Yes.
Um, okay, so let's look at the colloidal glasses. Um, so if you look now, that now we're just, let's think about hard spheres, okay? No attractive interaction, just colloidal glasses. Let's understand something about how we can do it. I think that, um, I know David uh, Reichman talked, and he must have talked about mode coupling theorem theory, and you know all there is to know about mode coupling theory. Bobo does. <laughs> Patrick does. I know nothing. I know nothing. I, uh, I, uh, David is fabulous. He, he gives lectures to our, when he, when he was at Harvard, he used to give lectures to my group. And, ah, I still don't understand them. My students did, fortunately. <laughs> They're much smarter than me. Okay, anyways, um, you know, you could do light scattering. So these are old data. I'll just show you some real old data about colloidal glasses. Um, these are light scattering. Remember, there's no structure. There's nothing that, that dictates the structure. The only thing that dictates the structure is the fact that the particles can't overlap. So there is a peak as you increase the volume fraction. There is a peak in the structure factor. There's this correlation. This is the, um, this is the structure factor. This is the inverse or the Fourier transform of the spatial correlation function. There is a peak in the structure factor, and that's because the particles can't overlap. So there's ex this exclusion region due to the fact that they can't overlap. There's a, ver a region uh, where they can't exist. There's no particles that correlate. And that piles up uh, particles some distance away. So this is what the structure factor looks like. You can now, um, for these different samples and different values of Q, you can study the um, light scattering. So why I show this is that you can um, look at these things and you can measure the dynamic light scattering at a low Q, in here or at high Q here. And there are different correlations, there are different physics. In one case, the um, low Q, what are you doing? Low Q, you're probing large length scales. And so there you're just measuring these sort of long range uh, structural fluctuations, long range um, um, cor um, compressive um, uh, correlations. And so there's something, but it's really very, very small. If you look carefully in here, you'll see there actually is a little bit of a, of a correlation, sort of like a sound wave, a very long wavelength sound wave. At high, at high Q, you're looking at very short length scales. So there, the particles are moving, but now they're still not actually fixed into a solid. There's still some space between them. And so you can probe how they be, uh, behave between them. And so if you do this and you look at the... Uh, the um, dynamic light scattering. These you can see these are ancient data because they're just plotted linear scale, taking a logarithm. Now we plot them on a log plot, um, and uh, they're but they're plotted. Um, so this is essentially an exponential uh, behavior, and you can see that as the volume fraction increases, these are increasing volume fractions. The uh, decay slows down, um, and um, in fact. If you take the inverse of this, you see that if you look over the scattering function, you see that the, it, there's an inverse relationship. It follows the scattering uh, factor. So here, it takes a long time to decay because now you're asking, can I change the structure at these very large length scales? It's almost impossible to do. It can be done at these length scales, um, but there's a correlation between the dynamics and the, and the structure. But you can go a little bit farther. You can uh, measure the slope of these things. There's a short time and a long time. Uh, do I have something? Well, uh, yeah, this is um, yeah, this is looking at short time and long time. This is the blow up of the short time. You see how it looks? There's a fast decay and a slower decay. This will be the same at different wave vectors. Uh, so you can measure the correlations. And if you look at relatively high concentrations, not super high concentrations, relatively high concentrations, 40%, 50% uh, colloidal particles, you see that, um, and I measure the viscosity as a function of shear rate. It looks like something like this. At high, um, uh, um, at high shear rates, I'm really turning it, then the uh, viscosity decreases a bit. I'm stirring it up. And you can correlate these with the time dependence of the um, uh, uh, particle motion of the mean square displacement. These are looking at the, um, the high frequency and the low frequencies um, viscosity. 
and if you measure the diffusion coefficient as a function of volume fraction and you plot the inverse viscosity, you see there's a strong correlation for the short time and there's also a strong correlation for the long time. So there's a relationship between the, the um, uh, rheological measurements and the light scattering. And this is not really so surprising because what you're doing, the light scattering is measuring how the particles move with respect to one another. The viscosity is also a measure, if I do this, it's a measure of how the particles move one around one another. So they're strongly correlated with each other um, and in fact you get the same kind of measurements. And this will come back over and over and over again that there's a strong relationship between the motion of the particles and the rheological properties of the material. So then you can do these light scattering. Let me go back here. These are early light scattering. You notice that these things decay. Um, what's this? This is about a factor of 10 uh, decay. They just keep decaying and basically they decay to nothing. But if you look now plotting them, not no longer plotting them um, linearly in time, but rather as the logarithm of time, you see that um, at low volume fractions, uh, the particles will decay, but as you increase the volume fraction, then the decay stops and eventually it just decays a bit and then stops completely. And this is in fact, these measurements, these are really uh, ancient measurements due again to Peter Pusey, um, and these were one of the things that inspired people to think about using mode coupling theory uh, to describe uh, the colloidal glass. These lines here are calculations uh, using mode coupling theory. Um, if you do rheological behavior, so look at this. This is, um, you're increasing the volume fraction and at some point, so you can understand this actually in a very physical way and we'll come back and I'll show you this. Here, they're decaying and then the decay stops. So look, this is a logarithmic time so it can stop for several orders of magnitude in time and then it decays again. So for some reason, over some range, it, it, there's some motion and it stops and it decays. Um, if you do the rheology, you see the same thing. So here's the elastic constant. As you increase the, uh, um, as you increase the, um, the volume fraction, if I look at this, this is the elastic constant. This is the viscous constant. I'm sorry that you, you, you have to, uh, I, because I want to show them separately, you have to um, uh, compare these by eye. But if you do, you see that this is about one. This is about one. This is a little bit higher the, this, in the fluid. The, the loss module is a little bit higher, but as you increase them, you get this region now where at high frequencies, okay, that's at very short times, it starts to, uh, the, it becomes solid-like. At uh, low frequencies uh, or intermediate frequencies, it's a, it's a constant, and then at low frequencies, it starts to relax. And that's exactly what we saw with the light scattering, where at short times, that's high frequencies, it, there was nothing much that happened. It was like a solid. At some intermediate frequencies, it decayed for a bit, but then it stayed constant. It stayed constant. Nothing's moving. It's like a solid again. That's this region. And then at long times, it decayed. At low frequencies, it decayed and became fluid-like. Um, so you can um, understand all of this by taking the light scattering and calculating the mean square displacement or now with the modern way of doing it, doing microscopy, doing confocal microscopy and looking at all the particles and just measuring their motion. And here's some measurements now uh, of mean square displacements of, by doing microscopy. Uh, this is confocal microscopy. Um, the 2D and 3D data is it, sort of just an um, um, uh, experimental detail that you can't look in at the three-dimensional motion at very short times, but it doesn't matter because the particles are essentially not moving very much. At long times, you really have to track things in three dimensions because they move a lot, but you can do this uh, now with modern uh, confocal microscopy. So this is what it looks like. And again, this should remind you of what you would get when you saw the light scattering. The light scattering said it's very strongly correlated at short times. Here's short times, it's strongly correlated. So the, uh, there's, not, the, the, there's not much motion. Then the correlation dropped, but then became constant over time. So here the, there's some motion, 
that's some de some uh, decorrelation, but not a decorrelation that particles haven't moved a full wavelength. And over some period of time, look, this is about three orders of magnitude in time, they don't move much. And then at long times, they decayed. At long times, the particles begin to move again. So this is exactly uh, looking at uh, what's what we would now call a supercooled fluid, right? At short times, um, there's motion that's exploring the cage around the, the particles. At uh, longer times, nothing happens, and eventually they break through the cage and find the larger times. And in fact, um, let's see, yeah, you can actually see this. You can uh, track any given particle and see what happens. And if you measure its trajectory as a function of time, it's stuck in one, uh, one cage like this. And every once in a while, it moves and it goes to a new cage. But now you can see this absolutely precisely. You can see it move through the cage. You can see the cage rearrangements because you can watch all the particles. You can label uh, by, by just uh, saying, let me follow one given particle and watch its motion, and that's what it looks like. And in fact, if you just take a lot, a lot of different particles, that's what you always see. There's some trapping in the cage and a jump, and trapping in the cage and a jump. In fact, um, you can look at all the kind of statistics. You can um, uh, look at the, uh, the distribution of, uh, of step sizes. If you do the distribution of step sizes down here, there's a Gaussian. If you do the distribution of step sizes here, you find it's really far from a Gaussian. It's really broadened out. You can just measure the, uh, the non-Gaussian parameter looking at the, uh, the uh, fourth order compared to the square of the second order. Uh, it measures how non-Gaussian is. If you plot that, you see around where it rises, where it starts to relax, that's the cage breaking time. You see this large peak in the non-Gaussian parameter. Um, and so in fact, you can go back and you can now track each of the individual particles and you can watch for the uh, jumps, you can watch for the, uh, the um, um, uh, motion of the particles. You can define some characteristic time scale back here where this reaches the peak. You can um, define um, a length scale. You say, well, okay, when have all the particles moved more than this length scale? here, this length scale. Um, and if you do this now and you just define particles, you take, you, you take snapshots at um, um, uh, separated by this characteristic time scale and just plot those particles that have undergone this cage jump and then just watch this in time, it looks like this. So these are the number of relaxing particles that fluctuate like this. This is time. And look what happens. Every once in a while, you see particles. They're not randomly distributed, right? They're really strongly correlated. So when particles relax, they don't relax everywhere. They relax in a very correlated fashion. They're spatially correlated. So um, let's see. If you go okay, if you go above this core, above uh, uh, here where you're now really into this glass regime, and you look at it again, you see that you lose a lot of the spatial correlations. And so you can do this as a function of volume. Well, okay, here this is just looking at the fluctuations. You can measure. You can define these clusters of correlated particles, and you can ask what's their property. Uh, for example, they're fractal-like clusters. Their fractal dimension is about two. So they're extended in space. They fill more space, but they're really connected together. And you can measure the distribution, the size distribution of these things. And you can measure a characteristic size. And you see the characteristic size increases as you approach the point where the sample freezes, where it becomes a solid. So this is looking at dynamic heterogeneities. But this is really physically visualizing the dynamic heterogeneity. So what is the dynamic heterogeneity? Dynamic heterogeneity is that when one particle moves and undergoes a cage rearrangement, think of it, what the, what's that really saying? It's neighboring particles have to move out of the way. So somebody's following in. There has to be a correlation between these cage re rearrangements. And that's exactly what you're seeing. You're seeing that now in real space and real time you're seeing these dynamic heterogeneity. This is exactly what the dynamic heterogeneities are. And so you can um, map this on to all the theories of dynamic heterogeneities. This is really an early um, visualization, direct visualization of the dynamic heterogeneity.
Okay, I would like to go on and uh, tomorrow I'll uh, go on and uh, tell you something a little bit about, um, um, first of all, the something about directly relating the motion of the particles to the rheological properties and then I'll try and describe a little bit about the other ranges of the phase behavior and try and show some interesting behavior there. Um, let me just say a couple of things. First of all, I'm really happy to take questions and if there's not time now, please come and find me. I'm going to have to apologize in advance that I'm going to have to run out right after the lecture tomorrow because I have to catch a flight. Um, some urgent thing came up. So if you want to talk to me, I'm around all day today, please feel free. Um, and if there's something urgent tomorrow, just email me. I promise I'll answer your question. And if I don't, just keep email emailing me. Patrick. Yeah, so, um, well, so I, I'm not an expert on super resolution, but um, it's Betzig, right, the guy who won the Nobel Prize. He's, he, pardon? Yeah, but Betzig, to me, the real, I mean, the other guys had done it quite a bit before. Betzig is the guy who really pushed super resolution. He and Xiaowei, uh, Zhang at, at Harvard, these guys really have pushed it, and they're getting better and better and better. And once you can get the time resolution up, then you can really start to look at much finer length scales. You could do the same experiment with smaller particles. It's not obvious to me that just going to smaller colloidal particles is going to teach you that much more. I think where you'll start really learning is if you start going to more atomic systems, like didn't Mark Eidegger talk? That sort of thing I think you might learn a lot more. That'd be, that would be my intuition. So anybody else have any urgent questions or are you all too hungry? Okay.